Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, my name is Philip Jaroslow. I'm an Associate Director of Admissions with Ross University School of Vet Medicine. Uh, we're very excited today uh, to have our guest, Dr. Tris Clark, uh, who uh, is uh, working at SeaWorld and a graduate from Ross of 2008. And so he's going to go through uh, some different cases that he's uh, encountered in his time at SeaWorld. And uh, we're going to have some questions that we can answer for you. So feel free to type those in as you're uh, um, watching the uh, presentation today. And we're going to go ahead and take care of all those at the end. So Dr. Clark can go through his whole uh, uh, presentation and give you all the good information. And then we'll get your uh, questions answered for you. So uh, Dr. Clark, I'm going to kick it over to you to uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, get started. All right. Well, thanks, Philip. So like Philip was saying, my name is Dr. Trey Clark. I'm the senior staff veterinarian here at uh, SeaWorld San Diego. I've been here for about four years, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my story first and how I got here. Uh, so, you know, how, how did I get into animals? How did I get into zoo medicine? Uh, for the longest time, I've always wanted to, to work with animals, right? Um, unfortunately, when I, during my childhood, I never had a dog, which is kind of funny and surprising to people. I never, I'm allergic to cats. So that kind of took them out of the the uh, the equation, and so my dad, when I was a little kid, my dad bought me my, uh, my first anole lizard, right? So a little tiny chameleon to see in pet stores and everything like that. And after that, man, I was sold. I was reptile crazy. I'm still a herp nerd. Uh, I have a bunch of reptiles at home, uh, but from that, I was like, I want to do this. I want to be a zookeeper. I, I went to every zoo I could. Uh, go to every pet store I could go to, check out the reptile section or crazy bird section, uh, fish sections and things like that. Um, but then luckily my father is a, an ER physician and he took me on a few of his night shifts. And I got to see some really, really cool things. I got to see, uh, unfortunately, a little girl that got run over by a quad and had like half her hand missing. Uh, I saw gunshot wounds, uh, you know, open heart stuff. And, I, you know, I was blown away by that. I was, I want to be that. And I kind of went, went home to my mom and I was like, mom, I'm really conflicted. You know, as, as much as a 12 year old boy can be conflicted. Um, I wanted to be a zookeeper, but I also wanted to be a doctor too. And I didn't know what I could, you know, how I could go across this dilemma. And, you know, she told me, well, Trey, you can be an animal doctor too. And my little 12 year old mind just went, you know, blew up. Uh, and you know, from then on, I wanted to be, uh, I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian and I always loved exotics and, you know, my whole model growing up was if it can't kill me, I don't want to treat it. Um, so I wanted to drive and keep going towards zoo, zoo to aquatic medicine. So I went to undergrad, uh, a little animal and got my bachelor degree in small animal science, a little college in, uh, uh, Pennsylvania called Delaware Valley college. Uh, and then from there I got into Ross where I had a great time, um, I was there from 2004 on the island to 2006, and I graduated in January 2008. I did my fourth year, my clinical year at University of Tennessee, where I had a, a great time as well, got a lot of good exposure to uh, exotic animals. And from there, I went into practice. I was actually a small animal practitioner uh, at a really nice practice, um, about seven doctor practice in Gloucester, Virginia. And luckily, one of uh, one of the head vets there was also the vet for the Virginia Beach Aquarium. Um, so I had the fortune in, uh, to work with him. He's still my mentor today. His name is Dr. Bob George. Um, he was one of the head vets for the Virginia Beach Aquarium and also the Ripley's Aquariums that are in South Carolina, Toronto, uh, and, and Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And so he kind of got me into the aquarium field and I worked Six, five days a week at the uh, at the small animal practice, kind of getting my medicine legs underneath me. Uh, and then I worked one day a week at the Virginia Beach Aquarium, which I really got my feet wet, both literally and metaphorically, right? Um, and so from there, I, I had the amazing opportunity to get a, uh, a zoological medicine residency. Um, I got a, my zoo medicine residency at North Carolina State University. And from there, man, I got some of the greatest mentors uh, in the game, Dr. Michael Stoskoff. Uh, Dr. Craig Harms, Dr. Uh, Michael Loomis, Greg Lubart, all those guys were some of my great mentors and still are to this day. Uh, and I learned a lot, uh, a lot about uh, fish medicine, any type of marine animal medicine, uh, aquatic medicine, and also zoo, uh, regular terrestrial medicine. Uh, so I was there for three years. Uh, and then I got my first big boy job uh, at uh, Audubon Nature Institute. So I was the head vet there at the aquarium. 
uh, in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I was there for about five years and change. And then I got my one of my dream jobs working at SeaWorld. And so I moved on. I've been here for for over four years. So uh, it's it's been a fun road. It's been a, a lot of different places. Uh, I'm also a diplomat of the College of uh, American College of Zoological Medicine, actually, which is really neat. A little side note, I'm actually the first African-American to be a diplomat of that college. So that's pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, I had a lot of fun uh, during my residency. Uh, it exposed me to many different things. I was able to bump up my career, uh, started in New Orleans, and then now here at SeaWorld, where we treat uh, everything. I, you know, I tell the kids when they ask, I, I treat everything the light touches here. So we see, uh, you know, in a day we'll see uh, sea urchins, and then we'll, I can work on sharks all the way up to penguins, then killer whales or belugas at the end of the day. So we also have a very large, uh, robust rescue program uh, that and at times that can take up about 50% of our, our caseload, even more sometimes. Um, so we're, we're, we're constantly busy here at SeaWorld. We actually have three senior staff veterinarians here, uh, along with an internship. And then we have a full uh, medical staff, which is really neat. Um, we do all, all our in-house uh, blood work, um, some of these guys have been here for many years and one of the pioneers of uh, aquatic medicine, hematology and things like that. Uh, so we get, we're able to run our own samples in house, do microbiology, uh, pretty much most things we can do almost everything except PCR and we're working towards that. So, uh, we have a great lab here, great support staff that we can do a lot of cool, amazing things here at SeaWorld. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, fish medicine, right? So fish medicine, if you don't realize, yes, fish are animals too, and fish can get sick. Uh, so they need doctors like us to help take care of them. And, you know, a lot of veterinary students or people that are not familiar with the field are like, you know, can my koi get worked on too? And absolutely. The question, that, the answer to that question is absolutely. Uh, fish can feel pain. They, uh, they can get sick and, and, need surgery or, or medication that's obviously going to go about uh we're going to go about it a little bit differently uh than you would your normal dog or cat um but you know the same medicine rules apply for them animal for those animals just like your your regular horse your dog your cat maybe i have to macgyver a little bit stuff to to make it work but uh they're they're just the same uh so we actually see a lot of fish here at sea it's one of my specialties i'm a big shark and fish guy uh, so we see a lot of different creatures and one of my, some of my favorite uh, animals that we'll see uh, coming up shortly is I, I like to work on sharks. Some of our black tip reef sharks here uh, are really neat uh, cases to work on. They're always, they, they can be interesting at some points in time, but uh, they're, they're pretty fun animals to work on. Um, yes, they do have big teeth and yes, they can hurt. Um, so we kind of have a picture uh, right here of us working on a sand tiger shark. And that kind of goes to show you how many people need to be involved sometimes. And these, if you guys aren't familiar with sand tiger sharks, they're they're found all over the world in different oceans. Uh, there's definitely a big breeding ground up the Northeast near Delaware. Um, and these animals can get quite large. They can, uh, females can get probably up to uh, close to an or over 200 pounds, almost about eight feet in length, some, some of them. Uh, males are a little bit smaller, probably around 150 feet in length. And these are kind of the classic sharks you see, and they're really popular in aquariums. They're amazing aquarium exhibits. Um, uh, these guys have the really jagged teeth, and they really look like a shark, right? When you envision sharks, you envision a sand tiger shark instinctively. Uh, so these guys are found all over, um, and we have several of them here at SeaWorld San Diego. Uh, and this is us actually giving a workup on one of our males um, that we were uh, wasn't doing right. You know, the aquarius. Of course, they're kind of like our keepers, right? Your zookeepers and things like that to kind of put in small animal or large animal practice terms. Those are your clients. Those are the guys that are on the front line. They're going to be telling you uh, what's wrong with the animal or I think my animal's sick. Um, and they're going to have the closest eyes. And these guys are really, really good. They know when something's off. And you have to remember these animals, these wild animals are trained. They're evolved to not show anything, right? If they show sickness or weakness, that means they're dinner for somebody else. So sometimes it can be very hard for these animals to detect uh, some type you know, disease processes in them. So the, the aquarists here are really keen on, on looking at that. If they notice the animal's a little bit slower or it's swimming a little bit differently, that kind of clues us into uh, to maybe there, there might be something more going on here. Um, so this animal was a little off. And so what we did was we brought him into our, 
Right, you know, how do you, the another big question is how do you get a shark, right? Uh, so there are actually many different ways we can do it. We can actually sedate them. Uh, occasionally, you know, have a really aggressive shark. Remember, they don't know we're trying to help us. Uh, we're trying to help them, right? So they're usually going to act out a little bit. Uh, and they do have big teeth um, and they can't hurt. So sometimes we'll sedate them so I can give them a little injection on the back uh, when they swim around. And that will, those drugs, usually I use uh, dexmedetomidine or metatomidine or derivative of that. And uh, they'll slow down enough and they kind of stop caring about their surroundings. Uh, and so then we'll have divers go in uh, and then we'll have them, we have a, a big, uh, a big shark net, uh, actually looks like a big condom, right? It comes over the shark, uh, and, and, uh, we'll grab it in and move it into our, our medical pool. And from there, we're able to work and handle the shark, making sure we're always safe. Uh, we put the animal in a stretcher and then we can sometimes do what's called tonic immobility. So and you guys kind of all seen on national geographic where you'll have, di I don't always recommend it, make sure you professionally do it, but you'll see divers, you know, uh, turn a tiger shark on its back and it kind of lays there. Well, that's that's called tonic immobility, and it's kind of a sleep state. Uh, the sharks can wake out of wake up out of it if you do something uh, uh, to uh, to mess with them. So it's it's not it's a false sense of security if you think that's really going to help you from for, uh, prevent you from getting bit. Um, but we're able to to work on their their sleep somewhat a little bit. We can do a lot of non invasive procedures. Uh, so in that picture, the picture previous, we were looking at we we're ultrasounding the animal. Ultrasound works great underwater. Uh, we can actually get a get a good view of all the all the organs. We can look at the liver. Uh, sharks are pretty much made up of liver, right? They have a huge liver that helps with their buoyancy, actually, uh, as well as their your normal metabolic processes. Um, so we can look at their liver. We can look at their spiral colon, which is essentially a larger organ, uh, almost like it almost acts like a rumen uh, for for uh, for sharks, right? It has multiple leaflets in it that provides surface area for digestion. Uh, we can look at their, their uh, re reproductive organs. We can see if they're pregnant or not. And we also can get blood from them. We can look at their blood values just like you would any dog, cat, or horse, or pig, or anything like that, and uh, to see if there's any type of disease process going on. Um, so in this picture right here, we have uh, me and my other senior staff veterinarian, Dr. Kelsey Herrick, we're ultrasounding this uh, large male sand tiger shark. And we have a bunch of people on the on the side uh, with a stretcher, kind of making sure the, the head is secure, because obviously that's the dangerous end. Um, and so with this guy, got a got a good clean bill of health. We gave him some fluids and some antibiotics, uh, and he was on his way afterwards. So this guy is doing well now. Uh, we're not worried about him. And then uh, in some of the other cool cases, we work with a lot of other smaller sharks. So our black tip reef sharks, we have a large number of Pacific black tip reef sharks. Uh, and these guys occasionally, uh, during reproduction season, breeding season, the, the males can get a little too aggressive sometimes, even aggress on themselves or uh, other females. And sometimes that leaves big bite wounds, right? So what are you gonna do? Remember, we can do anything pretty much you can do on a dog or cat. So if you have a big open wound, uh, we wanna close that, right? Because we wanna make sure that nothing's getting into it. Uh, we wanna prevent infection from seeding in or anybody else tearing back into it. So this is a picture of us working on uh, this specific uh, black tip reef shark. We kind of do the same thing. We have the animal in a stretcher. We have these little bite blocks in them, uh, uh, bite poles. So we, you know, if the animal were to move or twitch, uh, we can uh, we can prevent ourselves from getting hurt. And that animal was sedated. And so for this guy, this is one of the cooler cases I've had. This guy had multiple lacer large laceration wounds on its ventrum, so its underbelly. Uh, enough that was almost kind of poking through to the underside and actually could, uh, through the peritoneum, and actually could have uh, ruptured his, uh, his, his stomach or his intestines could have popped out. So this is a big surgery we had to do and make sure that we did it right. Uh, so we're able to sedate the, this, uh, this animal, um, bring him back into the med pool, and I did surgery. You know, we sedated the shark. We have, um, we have pumps that are pump constantly pumping water through the gills because remember, they don't have lungs. They're using their gills as lungs, right? And so we want we want to make sure that uh, water, aka oxygen, is constantly being flowed over their gills and they're breathing. Um, so we had a large pump pumping uh, water through its gills, making sure it's oxygenated on one side, and then we lifted up the uh, the shark from uh, the underside and just to kind of get it up out of the water. 
and I had all my my suture material and my surgery pack up on a rock ledge that was uh, uh, right near us. And you know, sometimes you gotta, like I said, they don't make stuff for the for some of the things that we do. So you gotta MacGyver a lot of it. So my surgery table was a piece of rock, uh, and so we're using that and um, uh, using that and suture this guy up. And the thing, cool thing about sharks is their skin is incredibly, incredibly tough. Uh, it's imagine it, they're essentially made out of tiny teeth, right? And so even for if you guys have seen a regular suture, you guys seen all in, in Grey's Anatomy and things like that, we can easily go through with one suture thread, the big needle on the top, and just kind of go through and through. I could pass that through one time uh, through a shark. After that, it dulls the needle enough so that I can't penetrate the other side. So what we actually have to do is I, I come a little technique. I use a 18 gauge needle, I actually pierce it through uh, one side and kind of thread the needle, uh, thread the suture through on the other side, and kind of continuously doing that to uh, get a good suture and apposition so the skin can close. And this dye did great. Um, that's been about two years ago, and you can barely tell there's uh, anything wrong with them. So. This guy got out pretty much scot free. His intestines are fine. He didn't fall out of his body, um, so he did. He did a, a, a great job, and I was really, really pleased on how this this uh, uh, surgery suture went. Uh, and you know, and sometimes we got to make sure that you know once you put the, people don't realize or people do realize that sharks are apex predators, right? So they're gonna once again kind of going back to that basic sense weakness. So we have to make sure that when we release the animal, he's a little woozy and things like that. Those other animals in the exhibit will definitely pick up on that. So we not only have to make sure that our shark is, that our patient is doing well and will survive and whatnot, we have to kind of make sure we watch out for the next step, right? So he's got to compete with all the other guys. So for this particular animal, we let him play in the, uh, we had a, a, an offsite medical pool that we put him in just so he was kind of by less aggressive animals. And then once he was 100% better, uh, we were able to to move that guy back into the main population uh, and where he's doing great today. So he, like I said, you can't even tell. Um, so that's, you know, you can do surgery on sharks. Who thought, right? Uh, and actually, I'll, I'll tell you this much. Fish patients and shark, elasmobranch patients, were, which are rays and sharks, are actually probably better anesthetic patients than I would say a dog or cat. These guys really do well as long as you're oxygenating them uh, and blowing uh uh, good water through their gills, they do amazing, right? Uh, so it's the I really enjoy doing them. We do a lot of uh, well, we you know we kind of we don't plan on doing surgeries, but when they happen, we're certainly we certainly do them. We've done a, a ton of uh, other smaller fish uh, surgeries where we actually will come up with we make a little fish table on it, essentially, so it's big a big foam pad, um, and we'll place a catheter in their mouth. And we have a little pump gunning running through. And so it's just recirculating uh, oxygenated water. Sometimes we can use something called MS222, uh, which is a anesthetic. Uh, it's actually related to lidocaine. Uh, and we can submerge that. It's a powder and we can place that in the water. And that's how we can anesthetize fish. Uh, so we use that a lot. We'll have that recirculating in the, in the water. Uh, and that's how we keep the animals anesthetized for the most part, along with injectable drugs and things like that. Um, so yeah, fish, uh, fish medicine and, and, and fish surgery are definitely very real and things that we do here all the time. Uh, and, and people are starting to kind of pick up on it. We're starting to learn a lot more. Uh, we're even spaying some animals now. We'll spay uh, some shark species and ray species now, which is a, it's a big deal because it's their reproductive tract is not always where you would think, right? There, there's some of them, uh, for some animals, their reproductive tract, their ovaries are actually almost right past their gills, so right near their head. Uh, and then it kind of extends the entire length down of, of the animal. So we're breaking new ground on this all the time. We collaborate with a lot of different folks from a lot of different places, just trying to build up the collective medical knowledge of these animals. Because granted, we're making more books out of them, out of uh, fish medicine and learning more and more. But man, for half the stuff we do, there is no, uh, there is no golden standard. There is no book. Uh, about it. So we kind of have to think on the fly um, and and think of what's best to do and, and learn from each other's experiences. That why, that's why we have a large consortium of people and say, hey, this didn't work. I tried this. Don't try doing that. Um, or this worked. Try this. Or I can modify that uh, for your situation. So it, it really helps having a, a good collaborative team uh, that you work with or 
I have my personal, I have uh, several friends in the industry that I'm always looking to call and say, you know, hey, is this a stupid idea or do you think this will work? I try. Yeah, I think this will work. And, you know, we'll go ahead and try it. So it's, it's all about innovation, too. Trying to We're trying to push the envelope definitely here at SeaWorld of, of uh, aquatic medicine uh, and, and try to take it further so we can better treat these, uh, these kinds of species. And then I'll talk a little bit about, uh, here, drink real quick. I'll talk a little bit about our rescue program. So we actually have a, a, a really large, robust rescue program here at SeaWorld San Diego. SeaWorld in general is probably one of the largest rescue wildlife rescue organizations in the world. Uh, here in California, we are the largest on the southern and in Southern California, uh, the Marine Mammal Center, another collaborating partner we work with up in uh, Northern California in Sausalito. Uh, it's probably one of the biggest ones in California, probably the second biggest. Um, and we see literally hundreds of animals every year. Uh, I'll see about a thousand uh, birds that come in. Uh, and these are aquatic birds. And we also, once again, are, we collaborate with a lot of different pe people. We all can't you know, save wildlife alone. Uh, so we collaborate a lot here in San Diego with our Project Wildlife crew, our uh, San Diego Humane Society, and um, they'll get a lot of the terrestrial birds. So if we're getting terrestrial birds through our rescue, our, our rescue team, we'll send it to them uh, because they're more set up for it. And if they get any uh, aquatic birds, say like grebes or pelicans or things like that, they'll send it to us because we're set up for aquatic species here. Uh, so we'll see about a thousand birds, aquatic birds a year. Uh, on any given year that can go fluctuate, you know, sometimes it'll be 800 and sometimes it'll be 1200. Uh, and then the same goes for marine mammals. So we'll see a large number of marine mammals uh, every year, probably from uh, 300 is probably our average. Uh, on up to 2015, we had a, what's called a UME, uh, unusual mortality event with uh, our um, California sea lines, where we saw probably over a thousand, close to uh, over a thousand um, uh, California sea lions, mainly pups that came through that year, uh, we would have about 300 on site at any given time. Uh, so we will, see, you know, if if the if the demand needs it, we'll definitely expand our, our operation. We actually closed down one of our, our our sections, our sea lion and otter section, and we had those keepers come back and help us too because it was all hands on deck. So sea lions everywhere, uh, and we returned essentially all of them, uh, which is an amazing story. Um, so we'll see a large, like I said, we'll see a large number of, of marine animals, uh, marine mammals, and occasionally we'll see, we'll do see some cetaceans. Um, unfortunately, those guys, if a cetacean strands, you know, there's usually something really, really wrong with it. Um, even if, you know, people are amazing bystanders and, and, and help be wanting to help. And, you know, a lot of times people push the animal back into the ocean. Unfortunately, you know, I can almost guarantee you that animal kind of just swims around it might strand on another beach a day later, or something like that. You, if a marine uh, cetacean strands, it's usually for a really, really good reason. Uh, and you usually see a lot of disease processes in them. Or sometimes we're starting to hear, we're starting to, to see that they're hard of hearing as well. Uh, maybe they're losing their hearing. That's why it's because they echolocate and uh, that's why they strand. Uh, so the picture here is we have a really cute, uh, I'll say, I don't say cute often, but these guys are kind of cool. Uh, these are our northern elephant seals, and this is a, uh, a neonate, or excuse me, a, a yearling that came through just recently, actually just this summer. Um, this guy came in July, and if you kind of look at his nose, his nose is a little shorter than what you would normally see, and that is because this guy literally had a giant baseball-sized hole right in the middle of his nose. We could see it was a, essentially, a, it was a nasal fistula. Uh, and so essentially we could see right down into his nares. We could see the septum, the, uh, the bridge that divides both your nares. We could see straight into that. Uh, and we've, you know, our rescue team rescued this guy up from a, a, a Northern beach, um, along our coast. And so he was in trouble, right? Cause obviously if he can't close his nose to dive down, this guy lives by diving. These elephant seals are some of the deepest divers. Uh, if he can't close his nose, he's not going to be able to survive. Um, so this guy came in, we, uh, we started him on some antibiotic therapy um, and took him to surgery to clean up that area. We actually did a, I did the surgery and did a great job, I, I'll say, uh, in, in closing it all up. 
These guys are such forceful breathers, though. Uh, within a week, he, he was so adjusted to breathing out literally his nose, uh, the hole in his nose and not his actual nares, that he actually, in a week's time, he blew all his sutures out. So I was like, well, okay, that's great. You can't tell and convince a northern sea lion or northern uh, elephant seal to just stop breathing through your open hole. Um, so we uh, we brought him back into surgery. We cleaned it up, uh, flushed it, continued to treat it on a daily basis, and uh, we actually left it open. And sure enough, this guy actually sealed down little by little. Um, his his hole uh, reduced in size. His body did amazing things. I'll tell you what, these marine mammals can do amazing things in, in, in regards to healing. Uh, and we were able to get this guy to contract enough so that the hole was pretty much absent and he was now breathing normally out of his nose. Uh, it was so much so that it was closed. And just this Thursday, we were able to release this guy back out into the wild, which was amazing. Uh, so that's the whole goal of our rehab game. Uh, is just to trying to get these guys back out, get them their best, get them the best shot, uh, best chance uh, at, at life uh, for us to uh, to uh, be able to return them back out to the wild. Uh, we see a large number of uh, some of the cases that we'll see. We'll see a large number of you know, unfortunately, hit by boats. Uh, we see a lot of fishing entanglements uh, for marine uh, mammals. We'll see a lot of fishing line entanglements, or we'll actually have. Um, Oh, yeah, here's a here's the picture of us releasing that that northern fur seal, uh, excuse me, northern elephant seal. Uh, but we'll see a lot of uh, fishing line entanglements where, you know, I'll have a small a small pup get entrapped in a fishing net, and as that animal grows, you know, they don't have any opposable thumbs that can't remove the net. Uh, it's the animal starts to grow, and then that net doesn't grow with it, right? So that net can entrap them and eventually cut into their skin. And uh, unfortunately, if you don't get Close enough. If you can't release that, um, they can die from it. Uh, so we've seen several large cases. We'll see those commonly. Uh, we see with birds, we'll see a lot of fishing hook ingestions. Uh, so we actually, when the birds come in, every bird that comes in to our rehab rescue program actually gets scanned with the same TSA medical, uh, metal, stand, metal scanner that you guys get when you go to the airport, which is kind of funny. Uh, and so they get scanned. And if they pop positive, we'll actually bring them over to the uh, veterinary hospital and we'll take an x-ray and we'll kind of see how many fish hooks they swallow. If there is fish hooks or any type of foreign object, we can actually see that on x-ray. And then through that, we'll, uh, we'll be able to use an oscopy and we can take a little, if you guys don't know what an oscopy is, imagine like a little um, camera that can go down your throat and we actually can uh, use forceps to grab uh, those, those hooks. And we're really successful at it. Um, and we'll get those guys out feeling better. If there's any tears or things out in their stomach, we'll treat them for that. And we're able to get a majority of these guys out the door, which is a pretty amazing feat. Um, and then some of the other cases that we've seen uh, are interesting. Within the past few, I say two years, we've seen a huge uptake uh, in shark bites in uh, some of our sea lions. So we have a very robust, which is good, it's bouncing back. It means that the population is bouncing back. But we have a very robust uh, great white population uh, out here uh, off the coast of San Diego. And uh, we'll actually, you know, on the menu is neonate or newborn uh, sea lions. That's just the natural history, the natural life cycle of these guys. So there's a large shelf off our coast. And these guys, the great whites, the juveniles, will like to hunt from from the bottom and they kind of explode they come up from the top to get a, a waiting sea line in the in the shallows um and that's how, and that's how they get these animals well you can tell that there's juveniles because they don't necessarily always know what to do when they do get these animals uh and, and or sometimes the seals are great which they're amazingly maneuver they have amazing maneuverability in the water uh, and they can escape from these guys but they're left with a pretty big souvenir present. Uh, you know, we'll see a large number of them with huge shark bite wounds uh, on their back, on their dorsum, somewhere, things like that. This is actually uh, a yearling uh, uh, California sea lion that we brought in that had a, a shark bite wound on its flipper. Uh, we've had several just recently. We had one that had its almost entire back, uh, just was teeth marks around it, right? And had a big piece of flesh missing. And so we were able to do extensive wound care. Um, we brought in uh, different types of drugs to treat them. 
uh, different type of suture techniques to try to bring this huge area of, uh, of skin together uh, that was, you know, all just all muscle. Um, and you also have to balance that with these guys also need to be in the water, right? So, you know, if you guys know, if you ever had a dog or a cat that had to be spayed, they don't want you to go swimming. Well, what do you do when you do surgery on an animal that lives naturally in the seawater? So it's kind of a balance that we have to strike with Mother Nature, uh, the natural history of the animal, and what we want to get accomplished through the surgery. Uh, so those are all things that we kind of have to balance into our, our medical plan, uh, which makes it quite challenging, uh, to be honest. But it's always, always rewarding uh, and, and fun in the end, and when we, especially when we get, get, can get these guys back and returned out to the wild. Um, so we'll see a large, like I was saying, we'll see a large number of shark bite wounds. We'll do the same diagnostics that you would do for any dog or cat. Uh, we will do, um, we'll do, if we need to do blood culture, we can culture them uh, to see what type of species of bacteria and what better choice of antibiotics to use. Uh, we'll also do x-rays. We do a large number of radiographs to, to figure out if there's bones are broken or things like that. Actually, we just recently had a, an animal that was released uh, just last month that he was so mangled by a shark that we actually had to am amputate his hind limb. Uh, we actually brought in a, a vacuum pack. We actually had this guy, uh, vac so vacuum therapy is, is becoming uh, more and more received through the medical field. And it's definitely very good to treat, to, excuse me, to, um, to promote granulation tissue and also to be antiseptic to prevent uh, antimicrobial uh, encroachment onto the, to the wounds. And so we actually stuck a, a, a vacuum pack. Now this guy, we did have to dry dock for, for a little bit, um, but we are able to use vacuum pack seals and uh, really uh, wrap that area. And we got this guy after a few weeks, his wounds were able to heal and they do fine with one flipper. And he was able to be released, back, returned back out into the wild. So that was a great story as well. Uh, but we'll run the same diet, like I was saying, same diagnostics you use in your normal practice, horse, dogs, cats, cows, we'll run here. So we, we, uh, we do uh, radiographs, um, uh, endoscopy, definitely in-house, uh, culture, blood, hematology, thing, all those things. And we actually even do CT scans or MRIs. Uh, grant, unfortunately, we don't have a CT scanner uh, directly in our hospital, but we certainly will use other CT scanners. We'll transport animals uh, to other local hospitals uh, to get a CT scan. Uh, just recently, I, I uh, transported a dolphin uh, to another local hospital to get a CT scan uh, to check on some of their health, uh, to check on their lungs and also their jaw. Um, so we'll we'll do anything actually. And then just last week we had a rescue animal that we brought to another local facility to do an MRI. So these are all things that we can do uh, in the exotic field that people don't normally think about, but it's the same type of medicine that you would do um, uh, in your normal practice, just maybe a little bit different and you have to be a little bit creative on how you do it. Um, but it's, these are really cool things that we get a chance to do and it's fun doing it every day. Uh, we also do a lot of sea turtle work. Uh, we're probably one of the largest, uh, on the West coast, we're the, the largest, sea, largest rehab, uh, sea turtle rehab facility on the West coast. So pretty much any animal that strands along our coastline, uh, we will eventually get it uh, because most of the other facilities don't have the space for it. Uh, we have a lot of large pools back here, as you can imagine, especially in our medical pools. Uh, so this is a picture of actually this turtle right here. Uh, this turtle was uh, rescued by uh, the folks at the Seattle Aquarium up in Washington. And they triage this animal, took great care of it, started on its amazing course of uh, of care. This animal had pneumonia. It's, it, it's called uh, what we call a cold stun in animals. So, uh, in turtles, uh, so turtles, as we, as we know, are reptiles. They're ectothermic. Uh, they rely on environmental heat uh, to uh, to maintain their uh, proper body temperature. So sometimes when these animals are, you know, they follow the currents, right? And so sometimes, if a large weather front comes through and all of a sudden drops the water temperature. Uh, and you know now it's winter, and these animals aren't be able to are, aren't able to get out of uh, that area. They actually be you know then their their core body temperature drops, uh, and then they're they're less active. They're more prone to uh, a lot of disease pro processes like pneumonia, 
they can get corneal ulcerations from being too buoyant uh, in the water column. Uh, they can develop a frostbite actually on their on their flippers if they're exposed to cold temperatures because they're floating on the surface of the water. Uh, so lots of different things can uh, can occur, and that's how boaters usually will, will find these guys. They'll either strand on the beach because they just allow the, the power of the waves to move them to a beach, or people just kind of find them floating in the ocean, uh, and they don't move once they come up to them. Um, so that's how we find a lot of these animals, and they're really debilitated uh, when, when they come to us. So the folks at Seattle triage this guy, uh, and then we, it's really neat. We took a, a, a Coast Guard plane down. Like I said, we collaborate with a lot of different entities. Uh, we took a Coast Guard plane down. This guy got a first-class ride uh, down to San Diego, and we were able to bring him here, and he finished out the rest of his uh, rehab here. And we were able to release him that summer when the animals were, uh, uh, when the excuse me, when the water was ready, uh, warm, and the current, warm currents were were near our way. And uh, this guy is doing great. We'll actually do a lot of satellite tagging uh, for different researchers for them. So we'll place a satellite tag actually on the turtle shell. Uh, and that lasts for hopefully about a year. So we can actually look at the whereabouts of where this animal is going. And this hope this will provide a lot more information uh, of the species in general. Because, you know, sea, tur sea turtles are pretty secretive. We know females when they come up, uh, up on shore to lay eggs. But that's pretty much it. Uh, we don't know a lot. We're starting to find more and more about males. Um, and what they do out in the wild. And then for the longest time, we really didn't know there was kind of that mysterious age class where, you know, you have animals that are newborn, uh, they run out to the ocean, they get followed by the currents, but like that two to three year period uh, or several year period that spans where the juvenile stage, we really didn't know where they hung out. We well, end up ha hanging out in the sargasm patches. So they'll hang out in these large patches of sargasm grass and that's where they live for, for the majority of their life until they become adults and they become more pelagic and start to venture off. They're, they're at a big enough size where they're, they're, less, they're on less and less of animals' menu items, right? Uh, so that's really good for the turtles. So this is kind of, we, you know, we, once again, we collaborate with a lot of different people. We're trying to re push the research of, of the natural history of these animals and just trying to find out where they go and what they do, and that way we can better protect them. So I think that's, that's a good question about it. Uh, I think we can open up for 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 questions, Phil, if you want, or, or we can keep talking. Just look, I can talk about this forever, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, definitely. We've got some good questions coming in. Um, so it sounds like you're very busy every day. It sounds like there's never a, a slow day for you. <laughs> yes, there's never, especially for me, there's never a slow day, really. Yeah. All right, well, let's start with this. Uh, Kirsten asks, uh, what internships and resi residency programs would you recommend a new DVM graduate completing in order to get a position at SeaWorld? What experience would make a student stand out? That's a, that's a great question. It's a question I get asked, uh, asked all the time. So the good thing is um, there really is no cookie cutter way to get into zoo medicine, which is good because many different people from many different fields can get into it. It's not like it's not so cookie cutter like, uh, say, surgery or small animal medicine, where you have to do an internship, then you have to do a fellowship, then you have to do a residency to get into to become a surgeon, right? Uh, that being said, um, we still, you know, I, I'm a part of our UC Davis uh, Zoological Medicine program, uh, so we support the uh, we're a part of that that residency. So uh, the residents will spend a year up in Sacramento Zoo. Uh, then they spend about several months here at SeaWorld San Diego learning uh, aquatic animals. And then they spend a year at the San Diego Zoo and then the Wild Animal Park to finish off their residency. Um, so those, you know, obviously I got to promote my own residency. UC Davis is a great residency. Also North Carolina State, that's my home one, right? Uh, I act absolutely love that program. Just can't say enough about it. Uh, there's, there's not as many residencies uh, in the country. There's probably about you know, seven or eight per year that are open for, you know, one person. And if, you know, you don't always have to go through the met, the residency route, and that's totally fine. Uh, one of the senior staff clinicians, uh, Dr. Todd Schmidt, who's probably one of the smartest uh, cetacean doctors in the world, uh, he didn't do a residency. You know, he worked in private practice for, a, for a, a number of years and then slowly got into the game and just kind of progressed from there. Um, so there's different, def definitely many different avenues. Uh, that you can take uh, and know, you know, you got to do what's best for you, right? If you feel like you need an internship, definitely get your do your internship, and that can be in large animal or small animal. 
uh, one of my old residence mates, who's the chief veterinarian at North Carolina Zoo, he did a large animal uh, internship. He didn't have to go through small animals. So, uh, and in, in, in the, I'll kind of segue a little bit into, or take off topic a little bit. Uh, when you are going through your veterinary program, I know a lot of people kind of focus like, oh, I only want to do small animals. Oh, I only want to do horses, or I don't want to do this. It's so important to kind of broaden your your mind and learn about the other species. Because, uh, excuse me, because I can guarantee you in your practice, even if you're a small animal clinician or you're a large animal clinician, you're going to see somebody's cat, you're going to see somebody's pig, or you know, you get weird stuff all the time. Uh, and I have friends from from my vet school days that you know were kind of like that. Like, oh, I'm only going to work on small animal. Oh, I'm only going to work on large animal. Well, that small animal clinician is now working in mixed animal practice and sees tons of goats and things like that. And that large animal clinician is working in uh, a small animal medicine right now. So you never know where life's going to take you. And to echo that, that that's so, so important in zoo medicine that you know everything. Um, because we, I apply so much of my knowledge that I learned from large animal medicine to say whale medicine, or I, I, I treat the I treat a, a sea lion the same way I would treat a dog. I treat a giraffe the same way I would treat a cow. I treat an elephant the same way I would treat a horse. Obviously there's some nuances, dolphins are just weird. Uh, but you know, there's, there's definitely some nuances, but the basic medicine is the same. And some of those same techniques that you use that you get really good at doing repetitious uh, repetitiously in, in small animal and things like, and large animal, those are vital to um, uh, your your success in zoological medicine. Um, so to kind of follow back to the story, we look for for our uh, residents, uh, we look that they have real world experience um, because it's really important that you know how to talk to clients. It's vitally important you know how to manage cases because I can tell you what, if you don't know how to treat a dog with or a cat with diabetes, there is no way you're going to treat an elephant with diabetes, right? Uh, you know, not to say that elephants get diabetes, but you, you kind of get the correlation because you're dealing with so many different things. Uh, the the complexity of the case goes uh, expounds dramatically, right? Because now you're dealing with multiple keepers. You're dealing with you know just on the admin side, you're dealing with curatorial staff. You're, so you're dealing with tons of clients. Uh, you're dealing with the logistics of actually delivering uh, a medicine to uh, a novel animal that's not always known. Uh, and then, you know, especially when there are bigger animals, do you have the amount? And how can you give that amount safely? Uh, so the complexities in zoological medicine just take your regular medicine and and really, you know, the logistics go, go exponentially up. Um, and then sometimes too, you know, well, you're dealing with an extremely endangered animal. I remember sometimes my, one of my keepers like, Trey, this Robin is not doing well. Oh yeah, by the way, there's only like four in the country. So don't kill it, <laughs> you know? So that's, that's no a pressure. big deal, right? You know, that's you're dealing with a species that's essentially priceless. Uh, and so if you don't have your, if you don't have your medicine legs underneath you, um, you don't know how to treat those little simple things there's no way you're going to be able to take that knowledge and uh, take it to the next level to treat exotic species, especially in the zoological world where, you know, you, you don't, you're not able to touch a lot of these animals or these animals definitely don't want to be touched by you. Um, so that's, that's hugely important. Um, so, you know, I, for me as a, as a recent grad, I would say, you know, start volunteering at your zoos or, or um, start seeing exotics at your practice uh, that gets, gets your foot wet into the door, your, your foot into the door, uh, and kind of start seeing what really goes on into that. And then you can also start uh, attending some of the zoological conferences. Um, there's American call uh, excuse me, uh, American Association of Zo Zoological Veterinarians, AAZV, uh, and then the aquatic version of that is IAAAM. Uh, and these are all great conferences that all the colleagues from around the world uh, essentially come to. Uh, it's a good place to get your, your name known, uh, get your familiar because, you know, this is a very small, it's a small group of people, right? And I, we pretty much know everybody. So uh, it's important to, to definitely uh, get your face shown, start to know people, start to get to know them. 
and honestly kind of start thinking about is this is this what you really want to do um you know everyone loves the idea of being a zoo vet but actually being a zoo vet is quite a different thing um you know it's long long hours i work about 10 hours every day 10 hours plus every day um sometimes it can be very political in the world uh in the zoo world because you're dealing with a lot of different people uh you're dealing with a lot of different entities uh because once again these are animals that are sometimes priceless uh so you have to be able to navigate those waters and not everybody can um you're also dealing with animals that there is a definite element of danger and risk uh and high stakes you know uh the, the sharks are kind of part of the easy part of my day but you know when you're dealing with the uh one ton walrus or, or or something like that that can hurt you you know you got to make sure and, you, and you're responsible not just for your own safety but you're if you're doing a procedure you're responsible for everybody's safety so that's that's a that's a big responsibility um that definitely people need to be aware of and unfortunately you know even though the zoo job is coveted and a lot of people want to be it it doesn't pay as well as your say your small animal or large animal clinicians um, and you really, you know, because a lot of these zoos are government or city run or, or local run zoos. And so their, their capital is not that much enough to pay you what you're worth, uh, to be quite frank. And, and so you have to deal with a lower base salary. And for sometimes that, that can be a deal breaker for people. But I always tell people there's also another way too, right? It, just because if you don't make it into zoo vets, uh, become a zoo veterinarian or aquatic veterinarian, doesn't mean it's the end, end all be all. Um, there definitely are, you know, for us, you know, like I was saying, we collaborate with a lot of people and that concludes in specialists. Uh, we talk to a ton of specialists. I'm a generalist. I do everything for everybody, right? But sometimes I need to, I need an ophthalmologist. And I can't tell you how many times we use ophthalmologists. And if you're that ophthalmologist that wants to work with exotic animals and wants to talk to us and can help us, man, I'm going to use you all the time. We use one of our uh, ophthalmologists from Orange County. We bring him in uh, down because honestly, nobody here in San Diego wants to take a look at him. Uh, and, and as crazy as that sounds, but you'd be surprised a lot of the specialists like, mm, I don't want to touch exotics. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be a part of, you know, they just get a little scared or whatnot and they don't want to work. Um, so if you're that person, you know, we'll bring in, so like when I was in the zoo world, uh, we would bring in a, a cardiologist all the time to uh, for our grade eights. So every time we knock down our gorilla, uh, we do uh, echocardiograms to monitor them because they, they have a tendency for uh, heart disease. Um, so if you're that person, that's a way to get into the zoo world and you get then you get the benefit of your own practice, uh, probably a little bit better pay. You don't have to deal with all the BS sometimes. So there's definitely many, many different avenues uh, on where you can get into to zoo medicine. You just don't have to be a zoo vet. Um, so, you know, and like I said, zoo vet's not for everybody, but there's definitely ways you can get in there. Uh, it's not necessarily cookie cutter too. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question in, in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that information. That's great. I thought it was interesting too. You mentioned how you worked with, you know, all the previous experience you had working with different animals really now goes to what you're doing now. And, you know, at Ross, as you know, you went through the curriculum. We do a very broad curriculum covering all aspects of vet medicine because, like you said, you never know where your career is going to take you. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Because looking at, you know, my, I'll tell you this, my equine experience at Ross, you know, getting to anesthetize donkeys, it's still the same as a horse, right, uh, became hugely important when I was knocking down uh, you know, when we had, excuse me, when I say knocking down, I mean anesthetizing. So when we were, when we were anesthetizing large antelopes, um, so these are big guys, right? And, or, or, you know, working on cows or things like that. Uh, and then elephants, I've gotten to do three elephant, uh, anesthesia procedures in my, in my career so far. And that's huge. I mean, how do you intubate an elephant? This is your, excuse me, this is your laryngoscope. So my hand was down the elephant's, uh, uh, mouth and to intubate it, and then those same those same rules to anesthesia apply. So that's that's vitally important, and I use that knowledge all the time when I'm I'm knocking down when I was uh, anesthetizing hoofstock, uh, you know, a lot of exotic species. So I can't tell you that was in, invaluable, invaluable, and it's important to 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 look at all because uh, if you kind of mess up and, and you know you kind of 
pigeonhole yourself, you're 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 taken away from the, the opportunities that you can do be better and and work at other things. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we'll go to the next question here. Uh, do you work with resident species as well as rescue species? And is your vet team divided uh, to avoid cross contamination? That is actually a very good question. Um, so the answer is yes to all of that. <laughs> um, so what we do is, so we work on, you know, we have three uh, senior staff veterinarians here and we, we see, we'll see everything. We'll see everything in a day. But for our rescue species, and more importantly, our, our marine mammal rescue species, um, we will we'll have like a, a rescue vet. We'll designate this person as the rescue vet. So once I, let's say I'm the rescue vet for, for, this, for the next month, um, I'll actually, you know, my goal is to, I, I only work on, I can work on the collection animals, um, but once I start working with, I usually save the rescue animals for later in the day so I don't cross contaminate. Uh, so I will see all my, all my rescue patients either later morning after we've seen the majority of our, our cases in, in, in the early morning, collection animal cases in the early morning, um, I'll, uh, I'll then work on my rescue animals and then I'll, I'll stay what's, what we say dirty, right? I'll, 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 I'll contaminate it. So I don't go out to the, uh, to the rest of the park after I worked on, on our rescue animals. And then we have a really amazing, really dedicated rescue team here. That's literally been here for eons and they're really good. But those guys, we have a, uh, rescue designated area um, and if we were going to go in there we don and dot off our clothes uh, so we'll have um, whether different scrubs or different boots and we have uh, uh, disinfectants foot baths and things like that and those rescue workers only work in the rescue area they don't venture out into the park or anything like that so they only work in our large rescue area or bird rescue area uh, and they'll and we'll once you know once I touch dirty animals, I'll stay dirty for the day and, and let the other vets work on um, some of the collection animals if needed. Okay, awesome. Uh, Megan would like to ask, how do you give sharks fluids? Is it IV or can you do SQ like many mammals? That's that's a good question. So there really is no sub-Q space per se for fish or lasbaranx, fish and elasbaranx in general. Um, so what we can do sometimes we can give intrasalomically so we can uh, so intra-abdominally for, for other animals, we can give intrasalomically in, in, uh, in fish and elasmobranchs, but I usually like to give it IV. Um, so sharks kind of have a really cool sinus right behind their dorsal fin. Uh, we can collect blood there, but it's, that blood is sometimes contaminated by a lymph. You have a lot of large lymph vasculature right there. Uh, so we actually will, um, we will, uh, we place an, but we can place a catheter there and you get, you can deliver fluids that way. Um, so when I have a recovering shark and I feel I need to give it fluids, um, I'll either give it, I'll give it while we're recovering it, uh, I'll give it uh, fluids in the uh, dorsal sinus right behind the, the dorsal fin. It works. So I usually have, I'm usually in the water, um, and I, I have waders on and um, we do, when sharks wake up from anesthesia, sharks are kind of like alligators. They have really explosive muscles, but they can, they can build up lactic acid really fast. Uh, so it's really important to keep their their fins moving. We kind of do this figure eight, um, uh, where, or not figure eight, but uh, figure push back motion, so we can keep their their fins going uh, and their their head going too, and that kind of helps push uh, that motion pushes blood flow back, so they can actually uh, dilute some of the the built up lactic acid, and they actually their muscles don't get stiff. Uh, because it's a very real problem that these animals can become really stiff after you work on them or if they're stationary for a point in time. Uh, so we'll actually uh, hold them and um, I'm usually in the in the uh, in the pool swimming with them and there's probably some little vet tech, you know, unfortunately who's stuck with the bottle of, of IV fluids kind of following me around. So, uh, but that's how we do it. No sub cube space really to give them those guys. Okay, awesome. So you kind of answered this question, but I think it's got kind of a good secondary point that you can maybe touch on. Uh, do any of your colleagues have a background in zookeeping or animal training? I have been told having a background in positive reinforcement and operant condition training helps with communication between trainers and vets with the husbandry behaviors the residents are asked to perform for various collections. That is a very great and well thought out question. Good job. <laughs> um, so 
Yes, it is. It's not bad to to know. I will say this: I I am not a trainer, but I respect training, and I and I I, I, I I'm open to. Uh, I know the proceed. I, I know uh, operant conditioning. So knowing about it, uh, respecting it, kind of knowing the ins and outs, has certainly helped me communicate more so with the the trainers here. Um, I don't necessarily you have, you don't have to be a trainer to to be able to do that. Just be aware of it uh, and know what the I, I kind of learned on the fly by based on on this. And I'm not going to lie, my fiance is actually a trainer too. So she tells me at home like, "Oh, you're a stupid trainer." This is this me I'm like oh okay now i get it um but yes having that background does definitely help uh in the ability to to communicate with your and know the limitations of what you're able to do uh with some of these animals so that yeah it's it it won't hurt put it that way it definitely won't hurt um uh, for me as in the, as a keeper um i definitely say it helps um it helps you know what uh if you have that keeper background, you, it helps you know the limitation of what you can and can't do, and what type of treatments uh, you can you're able to get away with. I'll, I'll tell you this: there's nothing more frustrating to a person, to a keeper, or you won't get compliance, good compliance with medical treatment. If you know you kind of think you're all high and mighty, you know, big veterinarian say, "I want you to give this animal injections twice a day for 20 days on a little tiny frog." You know, I mean that you got to have some compliance. You got to work with people. Uh, you got to know the limitations of what we can do. Uh, and so having a keeper based background, uh, I think definitely helps. Uh, I, myself, I, I worked at the Philadelphia zoo during undergrad and I was kind of their, their education person. Um, so I kept, took care of all the education animals. So we had a lot of, we had a large, large, uh, large number of reptiles too. I've got, I keep tons of reptiles at home. So I kind of have that keeper mentality. And so it helps me um, modify my treatment plans uh, and kind of get on the keeper's level. And with that, doing that, it helps better it become, you get a better successful outcome for treatment compliance. So keepers will pay more attention to like, okay, we can work with this. We can do this. And, and it hopefully helps the animal too in the long run. And that's, that's key. I can't tell you how much, how vital uh, just talking to your staff, uh, is important in your, especially for our field, is so important in, in the whole zoological field uh, because, you know, we can't do everything we want to do with, say, a normal, you know, what Plums prescribes us to do, right? Because a lot of these animals, you're not going to be able to touch them, or at least maybe you can touch them once a week, or they're going to stress out or die, or something else is going to happen that will lead to a negative sequelae. Uh, so kind of getting them with your keeper staff, knowing the natural history of this animal, like, oh, well, maybe if I wrap them this way, It'll allow me to do something else or or just kind of talking to the people is is key um you know I've, i'll say this i've known some of the smartest veterinarians in the world sometimes they make the worst zoo vets because they can't communicate to your keeper staff um uh on a, on a reasonable level and and that kind of fails communication unfortunately once again that goes back to the zoo medicine thing it, communication is key in, in zoo medicine so if you don't know how to communicate uh, it's, it's going to be a little rough for you because you have a lot of people to, uh, to talk to uh, in your, uh, because, you know, multiple people are taking care of these, this species or this animal or whatever. So, uh, yeah, it's a lot. That's kind of a roundabout way to answer the question. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I'm going to go through two more quick questions because I want to be aware of your time and know how busy you are. So oh, yeah. um, <laughs> Noah asks, what books or resources would you recommend reading or having on hand to learn more about aquatic animal medicine? That's a, that's a great question. Um, there are more and more books coming out now that are great for aquatic medicine. Uh, there's, oh, here, show. Uh, there's one book for marine mammals that's pretty much the Bible. Uh, it's literally called the Marine Mammal Medicine Book. Uh, so this is probably one of the, the Bibles for um, uh, marine mammal medicine. There's also a fish disease book by uh, Edward Noga. Hold on. This one is pretty good, uh, fish disease. And then this one came out from one of my friends, Dr. Steve Smith, who's a great uh, fish uh, medicine doctor, fish and disease and medicine. Really simple titles, right? Tells you straight to the point. Uh, but there's a lot, a lot more books uh, coming out on, on aquatic animal medicine. Always the uh, Fowler's, uh, let me show you. these are, 
these are mainstays in wild animal medicine. Uh, Fowler's Zoo and Wildlife Animal Medicine are key. Uh, these these are once again the bibles for for uh, uh, zoo medicine in general, exotic animal medicine. That's just some of them. There's there's tons more. Obviously, a lot of journals are great too. Uh, uh, AZV has a uh, JZWM Journal of Zoological Wildlife Medicine is a good journal, uh, amazing journal to, to read and, and get uh, current on on um, uh, new and current medicine techniques, and medications, and things like that. Awesome. All right, let's do one more. Um, how does one get involved with a rehabilitation program? Do most individuals have their DVM? Uh, for for uh, for rehab, no, not at all. Um, you mean if as far as uh, uh, for the veterinary, I've talked a little bit about the veterinary world, but then if you want to just volunteer, uh, there's lots of different uh, organiz rescue organizations that that allow volunteers to to work and help. Uh, and as a veterinarian, you can actually volunteer and uh, re uh, volunteer your time to help them uh, because a lot of these rescue organizations are kind of you know a lot of them are uh, poorly funded. Um, and so if you can volunteer your time, that would be amazing. Uh, some that do have uh, veterinary staff, sometimes they do appreciate um, having that uh, an extra set of eyes to help them. Um, so no, you don't definitely have to have a, a, a DVM to begin with to, to get into rescue animal medicine. Um, but there's lots of, if you are a DVM, there's lots of different rescue facilities all around the country. Um, you can start looking at their, you know, volunteering at those places to kind of get yourself in, get yourself familiar with what's happening um, and start learning wildlife medicine. And there's lots of different books and, and literature on that as well. Awesome. Well, um, yeah, we wanted to just thank you so much for your time. Like I said, I know how busy you are, so we appreciate yeah. you taking an hour to uh, talk to everybody. Do you have any uh, maybe parting words you want to say to any of the aspiring vets out there? Yeah, yeah definitely. Today? So thanks guys so much for having me. But, uh, you know, like I said, zoo medicine, some guys, we, we touched on a little bit, uh, you know, zoo medicine is hard and it's hard to get into, but you know what? And a lot of people are going to tell you, you can't do it, but somebody has got to do it. And, you know, why can't it be you? The same thing I said for myself, when I got into to vet school, I told everybody, I want to be a zoo doctor. And like, well, Trey, you know, it's hard to get into. I was like, yeah, I know, I know. I'm going to work hard and, and with hard work, a lot of hard work, a lot of sleepless nights, um, you put the time and you show you're good enough to do it and you're willing to learn, learn from others, uh, you can eventually make it. So uh, somebody's got to do it. Why can't you? Awesome. Love that. Well, uh, thanks again, Dr. Clark, for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. We really appreciate your time. Uh, if you want to get some more information about Ross and our program or anything else, the URL right there is what you can click on to and um, get more information. And uh, you can also feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about admissions or anything like that. But uh, thank you again, everyone. Have a great weekend and uh, take care.